Hi, my name is Scott Thayers, and my presentation is on lower limb amputations. Okay, so I'm going to start off with what an amputation is. An amputation is a surgical procedure to either partially or fully remove one or more of your arms or legs. Uh, this is usually due to treat an injury or a disease or an infection or to remove tumors. Um, there are different types of surg surgical procedures. I'm going to go over two now and then some more later. Uh, we have a closed or flap amputation. Uh, this amputation, basically, when a portion of the leg is cut off or the arm, they'll take uh, leftover soft tissue and they'll graft it over the site of the amputation. Um, then you have a skew flap amputation. It's the same thing, but it refers to the skewed look of how they uh, place the soft tissue and how they graft it. Um, open or guillotine amputation. This is uh, for situations where there's an infection. And what they'll do is after the amputation, they'll allow the wound, they'll leave the wound left over so that it drains out. And then they'll wait until the infection is fully gone and eliminate it before they close the wound and finish up. Um, a lower limb amputation, as it implies, and also referred to as lower extremity amputation, is the removal of the leg, the calf, and or the foot from the body. Uh, this is obviously due to surgery. It can also be resulted from an accident, severe physical trauma, cancer, disease, and a number of other reasons. So we have different categories of lower limb amputations. There are five in total. We have a hip disarticulation, which is an amputation at the hip, resulting in the loss of the entire leg. A transfemoral amputation, which is somewhere between the knee and the hip. Uh, we have a knee disarticulation, which is an amputation at the knee. We have transtibial amputation, which is anywhere between the knee and ankle joint. And then you have a foot amputation, uh, which is an amputation of the ankle or any other portion of the foot, such as the tarsals or even the toes. So here's the other ones I was talking about. We have the Lus Frank amputation. Uh, this one is at the tarsal metatarsal joint, and this one will also have a is also kind of a flap amputation where they'll use the sole of the foot as the flap. Uh, Boyd's and Piragoff's amputation. This amputation uh, connects the calcaneus to the tibia and fibula. Uh, this causes this produces a more weight bearing and better sta stabilized uh, stump. Uh, the difference between Boyd and Piragoff, which I kind of put them together because of the calcaneus. Boyd uses the entire calcaneus. It doesn't shave any of it off. But Piragoff uses only a portion of the calcaneus. So if you look at the picture, Piragoff is the top left. Couldn't really find one that was good for Boyd. So I kind of used this. I'm kind of using the same image for it. And the best one that kind of describes it is the one in the bottom right. Uh, it doesn't. It kind of shows a cutoff of the calcaneus, but it's close enough to get a rough idea of what it looks like. Uh, then we have Symes amputation. Uh, this one is an amputation of the entire foot, also the bottom portion of the tibia and the fibula, kind of where the uh, the pointed ends are. Uh, and it kind of it'll leave, and the point is to kind of leave like a flat surface at the bottom of the tibia and fibula for the stump to be more stable, yeah, better for weight bearing. Now, let's see, choke parts amputation. This one is through the mid-tarsal joint. Uh, it leaves the calcaneus, the talus, and other portions of the tarsals intact, also producing another uh, stump that is uh, better for weight bearing. So who is at risk? Uh, those who are diagnosed with diabetes, uh, the reason behind this is because diabetes can lead to hardening of the arteries, arthrosclerosis. Uh, those who are diagnosed with heart disease or an infection. Um, anybody who's diagnosed with these three are considered high risk compared to others. Uh, those who are those who have peripheral artery disease, um, blood flow, any blood flow disabilities or disorders, stuff like that is also the most common cause of amputations. Um, those are cancer, severe burns, frostbite, and serious wounds. 
um, those who work in risky environments such as construction sites and those who partake in risky behaviors uh, that would be somebody like a someone who rides a motorcycle through like intersections they're going at high speed they don't really stop for traffic something like that some statistics on sorry lower limb amputations uh, 54% of amputations are due to vascular diseases. This includes both uh, peripheral artery disease and diabetes mellitus. And diabetes mellitus by itself accounts for 30 to 40 percent and is the leading cause. Trauma accounts for 45 percent and cancer is about 2 percent or less. African Americans are four times more likely to have an amputation than white Americans. Uh, almost half of those who had an amputation uh, due to vascular diseases will die within five years. Uh, this rate is is higher than both breast than I think yeah it's breast colon prostate cancer. Uh, those who are diabetic and have a lower limb amputation uh, let's see up to 55 percent will have an amputation of the second leg within two to three years and chances of death are during from a major amputation is about somewhere between 10 to 20 percent so there's there are some surgical risk amputations above the knee are more risky than amputations below the knee this is usually a comparison of post mobility uh, infections and also death which is the most significant risk so here's some post-op effects and complications you have uh, joint deformity not the one that is intended one that's like way off you have hematoma, infection, reopening of the wound, necrosis of ceramic cells, joint contracture, which is loss of the range of motion at a joint that's closest to the amputation site, phantom sensation and pain, angina, heart attack, stroke, sores, blisters, uh, more serious amputations, you have an inability to walk or perform ADLs, and then you have a possibility of developing a mental disorder such as depression. So there are some medications prescribed. There's nothing specific for an amputee it's more before and after surgery so blood thinners are usually for clotting so we have i believe it's pronounced heparin um doctors may also ask the uh, patient to not take blood thinners beforehand before the surgery and the, the same thing applies to painkillers as well which are also used for the phantom pain that may come about after surgery or after an amputation. This could be aspirin, ibuprofen, warfarin. I also found that they use salmon calcitonin as well, which is used as a painkiller, but it also is used to prevent bone breakdown and increase bone density. There's also antibiotics for infections. And since we're talking about people with diabetes who may have an amputation, they're also taking stuff like metformin and how they work around taking that is usually based on what the doctor recommends. So the importance of exercise. Uh, those who have an amputee not due to any vascular issues uh, have higher rates of getting uh, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, or uh, adult onset diabetes compared to non-amputees. However, there's neither has a greater risk than the other. Uh, exercise improves quality of life, walking such as walking e efficacy and performing activities daily living. Some considerations, uh, lower limb amputees have a higher energy cost because they need to work harder to walk. Uh, the client should have a comfortable prosthetic limb that's designed for the activities that are being done. Uh, they should to make sure they avoid any skin breakdown, blisters, or irritation. They will have to have an appropriate stump sock setup, kind of like in this picture. This guy's a gel liner, 15 socks, and then a sleeve over it. And then you need to pay attention to their feet and their legs when, say, they're doing an upper body exercise that requires them to be stable. So an exercise prescription, with it, which I kind of found hard to find. There wasn't really anything in the ACSM guideline books, the ninth edition that we have. Uh, the information that I found was from earlier editions, and throughout this, I know it says not specified on here, but I kind of just went with the basic information that's in the guidelines. Like, uh, for example, there's aerobic exercise should be about 150 minutes a week of moderate activity, so something along those lines. 
So what I found for aerobic training, uh, frequency is about four to seven days per week. Intensity is about 40 to 80% of the heart rate reserve or about on a RPE of 11 to 16. Uh, time, it should take about, be about 30, 60 minutes. If appropriate, and they're just coming back from maybe therapy or it's, it's been, they haven't been exercising that long, you would start at maybe like 10 to 20 minutes and then work your way up. Uh, obviously, the exercises should be rhythmic, uh, include both amputated and non-amputated limbs. For resistance training, frequency is about two to three days, intensity 60 to 80% of the 1RM, or to at least use a weight that gets you up to eight reps maybe more. Uh, there wasn't any time specified and the type of exercises that I found was at least a common, it was a combination of at least two upper body, two lower body, and one core. Uh, and there's a, note, a nice note at the bottom that stretching is super important and should there should be stretching after every exercise session. Uh, another additions to their Basically, their physical physical health. I threw in uh, phantom limb movement therapy, which I actually did a paper on some semesters ago. Uh, this is for amputees dealing with phantom pain. Maybe the medication is not working. Maybe it's too much or they want to go off the medication and try something else. Uh, basically, this uses mental imagery or visualization as a coping strategy. Uh, and a study out Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, they found that motor imagery can significantly reduce phantom lip pain. However, it was out of all the participants, all the participants had different reactions to this uh, therapy. So it's not for everyone, and it doesn't always work, but it's worth a try. Um, also, yoga as well. Uh, yoga can improve and maintain balance, uh, help reduce stress, and improve flexibility. So. My example as a client, or my client example, uh, we have Bob, he's 30 years old, he's a male. Uh, he had a right calf, and his right calf and foot were amputated due to a motorcycle accident. Uh, he just finished prescribed physical therapy and is looking to follow through with recommendations of exercising. Uh, he can walk with a prosthetic limb and perform activities of daily living. Uh, he ran track in high school, uh, likes to run for about 30 minutes every other morning. He has an office job, sits most of the day. Uh, he also has a prosthetic limb that is adapted for both running and resistance training. And so the warm up for him would be about 5 to 10 minutes of light to moderate activity. This could be on you know, a walk, this could be just walking or even using a stationary bike. Uh, dynamic stretches and Warm up, and if he's doing resistance training, warm up sets, or to get himself acclimated to lifting weight. Uh, so for the exercise prescription for aerobic training, uh, since you just got back, I would say start with four days per week. Uh, the intensity would be at 40 to 60 percent of his heart rate reserve, 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, I would keep it to walking, jogging, or even a stationary bike. And then we'll slowly progress from there. Uh, resistance training. Let's see. He, I'll start at two days per week. Same thing because he just got a, a back from physical therapy. Uh, intensity at, I put at 60% of 1RM or keep it rep appropriate. For example, like whatever weight he could do, two sets of eight to 12 reps. Um, I would keep it 20 to 30 minutes in duration, and I would keep the exercise multi-joint, two upper, one core, two lower. Uh, example of this would be bench press, a chin up, maybe a sit up, wall squat, and a deadlift. Um, obviously for this one, I would also increase it at some point in time. Um, and then we have the cool down, five minutes, five to 10 minutes of light to moderate activity. It could be the walking or stationary bike again. And then at this point in time, I would also do static stretching. And that is it. Thanks for watching.